Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, we are very excited to have a fantastic webinar um, with the wonderful Dr. Adriana Bankston. Um, today, we are going to be talking about going from the bench to Capitol Hill and navigating a career in federal policymaking. So we do have a few housekeeping items to get through. Um, and we will have about 45 minutes of presentation time, then about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the session. So if you would please uh, direct and submit all of your questions, either in the Q&A or the chat box, and we will be sure to get to them. Um, if we run out of time and are unable to answer the entirety of the questions, um, Dr. Adriana Bankston has been so gracious enough to offer um, to address those questions and disseminate them after the fact. So. Uh, very excited to dive into today's topic. So in this discussion, Dr. Bankston will describe her career path from bench to policy, including experiences in various sectors along the way, including working with universities, nonprofits, and scientific societies. She will cover basic knowledge that participants should know if interested in policy careers, skills to build, the importance of mentors, and ways to get your foot in the door by building relationships and advancing your policy career. So for close to a decade, uh, Dr. Adriana Bankston has worked uh, to nurture U.S. competitiveness in sciences and technology through a number of roles in universities, nonprofits, and scientific societies. Adriana was selected as the inaugural AAS, uh, ASGCT, pardon me, that's a lot of acronyms, Congressional uh, Policy Fellow, starting um, in the fall of 2024, where she will be, uh, where she will provide science-based independent guidance to federal policymakers on Capitol Hill. Previously, Adriana was the principal legislative analyst with the University of California uh, Federal Government Relations, where she was advocated for the university's research priorities with Congress, the administration, and federal agencies. Adriana received the inaugural ARIES Emerging a Broader Impacts Leader Award, and the Top 20 in 2022 Award for Excellence in Advocacy from the Advocacy Association, among other honors. Adriana earned her PhD in Biochemistry, Cell and Developmental Biology from Emory University. And without further ado. Great. Thank you to NRMN for the invitation to speak to you today. Let's see if I can share my screen. Perfect. All right. So um, as uh, was described, uh, we'll, we'll delve into a number of different things today, but um, just by way of introduction, I'm currently uh, doing some consulting work in policy. And um, uh, as I said, I'm the incoming uh, congressional fellow, first, uh, first ever fellow sponsored by ASGCP through the AAAS program. I'm happy to cover that. but. Um, uh, today we'll talk about my background in science policy, my career path. We'll talk a little bit about some of the mentors that I've had along the way, um, as obviously that's a important focus and um, mentors have played a important role in my my path to date. Um, we'll talk a little bit about policy impact, different options, and ways you can get into the field, different settings and skills skills to build, and so on. So um, since I understand that uh, this is a new topic for NRMN, I wanted to start by giving you just some basic information about science policy um, concepts and definitions. So how we define national science policy, and you'll see a few resources and books in the bottom right um, as I reference this information. So science policy at the national level is defined as the set of federal rules, regulations, methods, practices, and guidelines under which scientific research is conducted. And there's sort of two important concepts. One is science for policy, which is um, scientific findings are used as the basis for the development of public policy, what you would normally think of evidence-based policy. This is um, a lot of the way that policymakers use evidence-based research for their um, making decisions, and policy for science, which is sort of where I've been in the past few years, um, are how do we think about governing the practice of science, what government laws, regulations, and policies affect how we do science, how we fund it, how we support the pipeline, and so on. And um, science and policy are, are interdependent and they influence each other, as we'll talk about, uh, I think, depending on where you are in the continuum or what kind of role you have in policy, 
you might be working in science for policy or policy for science or switching between the two, um, depending on the role that you have. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so a bit of history um, in terms of how did science and policy come to integrate in this interface? Um, so obviously policy is defined or um, depends on evidence-based support, uh, government decision-making, uh, re relies a lot on constituents, researchers, folks who have the background that can can help um, inform policy making, and um, translating the language between um, the two different communities is something that um, you would do if you are sort of, for example, in government relations, where um, you are always sort of speaking between speak the two languages between the two communities. Uh, interestingly, um, science and policy have not always been in contact. So um, before World War II, actually, science was really in contact with policy, right? And there's different ways to engage that we'll talk about. Um, <clears throat> policy is uh, generally thought of as the pursuit of the common good to serve the public interest. And um, some of the mechanisms by which science and policy interact are um, through science advice and also providing knowledge-based um, evidence to decision makers. Um, a couple of ways to look at this are, uh, these are a few frameworks that have been described in literature that um, you can think about this through capacity building. So we're building future policy leaders and also we want tools to support them. Uh, and this includes, again, science-based support for legislators and policymakers who are, who are making decisions based on research evidence. A uh, <clears throat> bit more of history, because I think this is real interesting and in some ways where the field started. Um, so you probably heard about, heard about this uh, seminal text, Science on this Frontier. Um, which was published by uh, Vannevar Bush uh, for President Roosevelt. He was, in essence, uh, he was an engineer um, and, in essence, the first presidential advisor um, for science. And, of course, throughout his career, has um, supported federal support for science. Um, this text uh, really has a lot of the beginnings of the field, I think, um, and in the book, um, he references that science can be effective in national welfare uh, as a member of a team, how science can influence um, what's going on in the government, and scientific progress is important um, for achieving a number of different directions, health, prosperity, security, and so on. So he really established um this concept of science-based policy and um, how that's something that um, we, st we still use today. Actually, the text um, and a lot of his work and his theories um, have led to the uh, development of, of the National Science Foundation in 1950, I believe. Um, so a good uh, thing to read if you're interested in policy, uh, sort of history of the field. Um, so... Well, you might want to think about this. Uh, of course, uh, it's interesting to engage in policy. It's something that um, you might not know why it's interesting, right? So why would I engage in policy? And I'll, I'll show you a few examples through my career. Um, but basically, um, policy provides a large uh, view of sort of societal issues exposes you to different ways of thinking, especially if you work in government and you're really understanding how science and policy interact. Um, it can expand your understanding of the world and different issues. And also uh, there is a lot of strategy involved when it comes to um, how you develop your policy idea, what's likely to, to move forward, um, what's a good ROI for what you're trying to do, who is likely to be interested in addressing audiences and so on. Um, the type of impact you can achieve, and we'll talk about this, uh, can really be the ability to address important societal problems, um, making a difference at an issue of interest. And so I'll sort of show you my career. Uh, I've sort of been interested in research, higher education issues, and use that as a thread throughout um, the different roles I've had. 
Um, it also can help you um, see the bigger picture and the larger scale of an issue. So you might be working on something in your state and what is the impact of this on the national scale or vice versa. Uh, and also it involves a lot of engagement of the community, uh, again, depending on the issue and the scope of uh, communities that are impacted and also can influence um, the policymaking and also engaging the public um, in um policymaking government as well. So um, how does it all work? Uh, transitioning a little bit to kind of how the sausage is made, I guess, how they say in DC. Um, this is a complicated web here, but it's um, sort of very illustrative of how things work. And again, I'll, I'll do my best to explain this. Um, um, in general, I would say policy is very collaborative. Uh, it involves a lot of consensus building and collective, collective decision making uh, across different stakeholders. Um, often there are uh, groups convening and coming together to be able to uh, come to a decision on an issue. Um, sometimes it's high level if you can't agree on the details, but uh, that's a really important skill in the field. Um, often these decisions are made with limited resources, imperf imperfect information. You sort of have to take the best information you can and, and move forward because a lot of times uh, it's very fast paced. You have to just decide based on what you have at hand. And also pluralistic in nature, again, involves a lot of different players. Um, so this web um, involves uh, main uh, actors in, in the center um different um uh offices so key white house offices ostp and omb federal agencies congressional committees and subcommittees um you have scientific interests represented by scientific societies university associations and ngos like the national academies um the press um or media here uh, connects all these groups to peripheral groups um, outside, for example, universities, industry, national labs, scientific societies, state and local governments, um, and also the general public. And all of these um, have specific interests in science policy, of course, serving um, their constituents, but uh, they interact with the groups in the center. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, the groups in the center of the web are continuously influenced by interactions um, with those in the outer thread, right? So everyone is um, talking to Congress and federal agencies, and they also are soliciting information from all these other groups uh, in the web. And so you can sort of start to imagine how this is complicated and um, how decisions are being made. Um, takes into account a lot of different um, views and stakeholders. Um, ways that you can engage, uh, again, this is a, a classical book, um, involve um, an issue advocates, and this is sort of where I've been uh, up to now, uh, trying to push a specific uh, agenda or outcome on some of those players that can make decisions, mainly the ones at the center of the web. Uh, honest brokers, unbiased, um, so you can provide sort of both sides of an issue to a legislator or policymaker. Um, they sometimes want to know what the pros and cons are. Uh, you're not really voicing an opinion, but they want to know both sides of the story and um, you're sort of the unbiased um, uh, player. Um, science Arbiter uh, has a narrow focus. They don't always influence <clears throat> policy, but um, may just focus on specific areas. And then you have peer scientists who don't engage with policy. Of course, not everyone does. And uh, this can be can happen in different um, uh, different levels, again, trying to push for certain things to happen or just being unbiased, sort of in the middle, providing both sides. Um, <clears throat> so this is um, all that I've had up to now with an introduction, hopefully gave you a good idea of thinking through how some of these players work together, how policy works. So I'll transition now into the second portion of my career and try to give you some ideas about things I've done and um, ways you can engage. Um, so in simplistic terms, uh, going from, <laughs> from academia to policy, um, so I got my bachelor's at Clemson, P 
PhD at Emory, did a postdoc at University of Louisville. So um, all in all, spent quite a number of years in um, academia. Um, <clears throat> during that time, um, became interested in how we can support the research pipeline, um, got involved kind of through the career development route um, of how universities can support uh, and provide opportunities for trainees who are interested in careers, including policy. I developed a, um, a career seminar series called Craft. I'll, I'll talk about that. And then got involved with larger groups that were working on um, sort of training scientists, the National Postdoc Association and the Graduate Career Consortium. Um, locally, since I was in Kentucky, I also got involved with the Kentucky Academy of Sciences. Uh, that gave me a bit of um, view into the local um, state level policy, but still related to research. Um, and this led to becoming interested in um, academic issues and policies that would impact the future of research, essentially. So um, got involved with this nonprofit that's actually called Future of Research that um, uh, did research on research, so to speak, on university policy. Um, we published some papers, including on postdoc salaries. I'll talk about that. Um, and then I'll also organize um, symposia to try to get early career researchers in leadership positions and advocating really for the future pipeline and uh, increasing voices of young people in science. Um, and this, um, I'll talk about this, but led to, <clears throat> to a broader interest of engaging in policy and skill building um, for trainees who are interested in the field. Um, and got involved with the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, which is a great way to learn um, some of this um, policy writing skills. I'll talk about this. Uh, and then had mentors along the way that helped sort of in this transition. Um, second, um, um, second bit of this, and I'll, I'll go more in depth, um, is once I started getting involved in policy, um, through these different groups. Uh, like I said, I was involved with the NPA. So I started uh, getting involved with organizations that are scientifically involved in, sort of in the policy side. Um, joined advocacy committee for the NPA. I was already involved with the American Society for Cell Biology from my research background. Um, joined their public policy committee, which was really instrumental um, in understanding how societies function in DC. And lately for the last year or so, I've been doing some consulting work. Uh, again, these are all different experiences that um, have helped uh, forge connections to different spaces. Um, and then my sort of big break, so to speak, was the fellowship that I did with Society for Neuroscience uh, that was focused on policy and advocacy. Uh, we learned how to advocate for research funding um, and training on Capitol Hill, um, worked on a training program. Um, I'll go more in depth here, but uh, this was really the first sort of foray into um, how scientists can get engaged in policy and advocate on the Hill, what it means to do this um, with Capitol Hill. And then, um, <clears throat> um, transitioned uh, over to work um, with University of California. So long story here, I lived in California before moving to DC and um, worked with a few of the campuses. And so that turned out to be a really good transition uh, to support research uh, policy for the University of California system. Um, they have a great office in DC. And um, again, we spent, I was there about four years um, working on, um, um, again, research policy for their um, scientists, uh, liaising between that and, and research or uh, Hill staffers um, through briefings and panels and discussions to showcase what they were working on, um, advocated for research funding, again, um, supporting a lot of that was during COVID too. So um, also, looking at um, how students in the UCs and nationwide were impacted um, by the pandemic and why we needed uh, lawmakers to continue supporting science because it was impacting um, the research pipeline. 
And also we worked with federal agencies, uh, again, to look at potential grant opportunities and ways to engage um, UC researchers in um, um, grant opportunities for um, at the federal level. Um, so currently I'm about to transition into a uh, congressional fellowship. I'll tell you about that, what I can tell you now. Um, but the idea is that all of these roles really um, have been focused on advocating for research and science and really wanted to see what it would be like to be in Congress and see what I can do there, having done a number of things along the way that I think this is sort of the next step for me to hopefully be able to support um, science from the other side. So uh, more to come on that. But, um, and I won't spend too much time on each of these slides, but um, just a little bit of, I guess, tidbits of, um, on each thing. Um, so my lab work, and I wanted to mention that, uh, you know, at this point, uh, I did most of my lab work in muscular dystrophy, uh, trying to understand how muscle functions normally, uh, what happens when it breaks down, research was going well. Um, this was actually the last press release that was published in my postdoc, uh, was highlighted by the U UofL um, uh, press um, office. So our research was going well. Um, we're highlighted by uh, APS and their journal. Uh, and I wanted to highlight also uh, Grace Pavlas, whose picture is here, so she was my grad school PI and um, really instilled a lot of confidence in me as a female scientist. Um, she then transitioned over to working more in industry. Um, but uh, since we're talking of, of mentors, I uh, wanted to mention her here because she was instrumental in my uh, research career and then transitioning over to other things and um, wanted to also make this point that um, although my research was going well, I was still interested in moving out um, to do something else. So um, what happened is, um, as I said, I was at UofL, it was sort of middle of nowhere. I was in Louisville, um, not the most exciting place to be, although I did go to the Kentucky Derby, I uh, recommend that. Um, but this is the way I really started uh, exploring my career during my postdoc uh, through this craft seminar, as I said, to bring speakers to talk to postdocs about careers. This became a monthly series. Uh, I shared a couple of uh, images here from policy talks that we had at the time. I wasn't really, didn't really know uh, what that meant to be in policy, but I invited people that were to understand what they were doing. Um, what we were trying to do here is um, connect a few universities in the Midwest through a research symposium. Um, and also I was on a postdoc committee to try to understand more about um, policies that were uh, impacting postdocs at the university. Uh, and then sort of expanded that, as I mentioned, through the NPA and GCC, where there are people that um, train postdocs and train grad students and think about careers and all of that. Um, that was a great network to build some of these contacts and advocate for trainees and um, policies for them. And then um, Kentucky Academy of Science, again, just trying to get more involved in policy in the state. Um, this is, uh, we actually established this award for excellence in science education and outreach, um, which still exists. This is 2016, I think. Um, and so this was a really good start um, or sort of seeding this idea of public engagement and um, rewarding scientists for getting involved in the community. So um, this led them to working with this nonprofit called Future of Research. So as I said, we're doing sort of research on research. Um, you can check them out online. Um, when we started this work, we wanted to really give a voice to early career researchers in, in science and policy. Um, we organized a number of symposia and then published um, the results from that when it comes to um, some of the um, um, things that we were hearing from trainees. And so you can check out some of the papers. Um, basically, um, we were doing sort of surveys on mentoring and career development, what trainees were looking to get from um, their advisors, from the institutions, what can the universities do better 
for them. And um, so we stumbled upon this project on Pulse Accelerates, which was and is relevant again. Um, uh, I think Pulsex can always get paid more, but um, in 2016, there was this federal labor law uh, mandating that Pulsex salaries would increase. And so we did a research study to look at um, how universities were complying with this federal law, essentially the Fair Labor Standards Act or FLSA. Um, so it was a really interesting project for me as I was becoming interested in sort of STEM pipeline questions and policies and also connecting really the federal landscape to universities. Um, we published a couple of papers about um, what institutions were doing. This was about halfway through uh, if they were going to comply with the law or not. We published a paper on how much uh, postdocs are getting paid, which was not a, e easy data to get. Um, but really shed some light on the fact that academia can be more transparent, um, that we were able to, uh, you know, actually push some universities to increase salaries, which they did based on our work. Um, and then just showing you another paper here, uh, we advocated for um, early career researchers to be in leadership positions in scientific societies, which did subsequently happen in a few of them. Um, so this work really did have an impact. Um, and for me personally, it was really connecting sort of the federal landscape to the university policy and how I could maybe impact it um, from DC. Uh, and before I move on, I just wanted to mention um, Gary McDowell, who's in the middle here. So he was the executive director and still continues to work on um, early career issues as well. Um, but again, he was instrumental in this, and we all um, sort of started this group together and um, achieved a lot, I think, um, to raise awareness for some of these issues for early career researchers. Um, the next sort of big thing, so as I was transitioning into policy, wanting to understand more about um, the federal landscape, uh, was the Journal of Science Policy and Governance. So I won't spend too much time on this, but um, I was the CEO until last year. Um, for the past few years. Um, but um, it's an early career journal. We publish policy papers in a number of formats, like op-eds and uh, longer, shorter versions. Um, we have um, workshops for policy writing and, and panel discussions and so on. It's really meant to be a forum where young people, again, can debate policy issues and, and publish the latest in their research. Um, there's active promotion and outreach going on of uh, the special issues and standard issues we publish um, and also the events. So you're welcome to attend. They're all online and free. Um, and just a, a couple of examples here. So this was an older issue that we worked um, with the UN. Actually, we, we worked with UNESCO um, since that point on. So it's international. We have different sponsors. Um, from all over the world. As you can see in the middle, we organize career panels and also we have a podcast, which is on the right. Um, different ways you can engage and I'm happy to talk more about this, but uh, it's a great way to engage in the field when you're starting out and um, get some things under your belt. Um, and again, here when I, at this point, when I was starting to, to get involved with JSPG, uh, I was still on the West Coast. Um, hadn't transitioned yet. And uh, so Shailene Jatishi who's in the middle here was the CEO at the time. Um, and again, he was really instrumental in sort of bringing me on to the staff and JSPG has played a huge role in my, in my career too. So again, another person to thank. And this was more of a peer mentoring at the time. Um, really helpful, something to think about uh, because um, people that see your potential that bring you into the field uh, are important. So moving on at the time uh, after that, have also um, engaged in a number of things along the way as I was trying to sort of mirror these or marry these two interests of federal policy, university work, um, how I could influence and help um, the STEM pipeline from the federal uh, level that I was not in DC yet. Um, so I, um, again, took advantage of groups that I was already involved with. So National Postdoc Association, there's an advocacy committee, worked on the writing team. Again, um, really useful. Uh, American Society, Society for Cell Biology was my um, disciplinary society, given my PhD was in biochemistry. 
So I started going to their um, policy events. Uh, also a good tip, take advantage of your society. Um, then because I was involved with Society for Neuroscience, um, I got involved with, with their DC chapter. They also have a policy committee. That's another good way to in get involved um, through a local chapter. And then um, for the past year, I've been doing consulting, which has been really interesting too um, when it comes to um, working with stakeholders in the field. So um, Sigma Xi is a research society. They wanted to get more involved in policy. Um, Federation of American Scientists um, is a group that's been around for a long time, but are doing really innovative things around policy entrepreneurship. Uh, and trying to push for policy change at the national level. And then working with George Mason also on another project. Um, so these are all things that have helped to increase my network. Again, some of the things have been involving sort of early or with groups that I was already involved in and just looking for policy opportunities. And then other things have been um, more recent. And again, since my network has grown over time, um, I've been able to do some really interesting projects in consulting too. So these are all ways that can can help you um, grow your network and try different things along the way. Um, I do want to mention Kevin Wilson, who's on the right here. So he was running this uh, public policy committee and he's on the staff, a uh, policy staff for ASCB. And again, at the time um, when I got involved with the committee, it was pretty early. Um, he was really a great mentor in that since he had been in this space for a long time. Time um, and brought me on board together with another um, early career person on the committee and really learned a lot from him. I think I was on there for three years or so. Um, really, it was a great primer to understanding how societies work with the federal landscape before I was with SFN. Um, so, really encourage you to, to get involved with SCB also if you can. It's a great society. Um, so, transitioning over to my fellowship with SFN. Um, this is where, again, as I said, everything sort of happened once I moved to DC and, um, this was a six month fellowship. So a quick turnaround to understand what's going on and, and what I wanted to do after, but really loved it here. Um, this is, um, so a few things that we did here, um, as a fellow worked with, um, their Hill Day, which is in the spring. So learn how to organize the Capitol Hill Day from the back end, which is really useful. It's a large, um, large society, large day. I think we had about 80 meetings or so. Um, we also, I also learned how to read legislation, um, worked on a congressional testimony from the SFN president, um, supporting um, research funding for neuroscience research. All these things are important, uh, different types of writing that, again, going back to JSPG and, and some of these things along the way, learning how to write some of these documents is really critical um, for policy roles. Um, we responded to an NIHRFI and the Brain Initiative that had just come out at the time. That's also a good way to contribute. Um, we worked on the Advocacy Network newsletter. So this is, again, really common to... Um, look at what's going on federally and summarize the latest um, topics and policy and advocacy for the members of SFN. I think this is a monthly newsletter um, and also contains uh, calls to action, ways that they can engage in advocacy and so on. Um, other things related to the Hill Day, we created this champion's checklist. Sorry, I'm jumping around here, but um, champion's checklist, which was... Um, which legislators would support your science research uh, so we can engage them and invite them to visit the labs, for example, for SFN members um, that uh, were at the conference. We invited them to the conference and also uh, during the Hill Day, um, make sure to, to, in, to visit the offices of those folks who, who had supported neuroscience in the past. Um, and the last thing here is the ECPA program. So this is Early Career Policy Ambassadors. Uh, I believe it's every year. Um, it's a program where trainees who are members of the society can apply to. Um, they sort of teach you advocacy um, trick, tips and tricks throughout the year. I think you have a project and then um, they have, I believe, 10, 10 to 12 
um, trainees that get selected for the Hill Day, and it's it's a really great experience. Um, again, and this is these are all things that I, I had never done. Uh, it was really exciting to be here and and learn all these things from um, the SFN staff. And again, I want to mention Adam Katz, who's on the right, bottom right. Um, he was a, a advocacy manager, I believe. I forget the exact title, but um, he re since then returned to SFN um, and he's now the director of the advocacy department, uh, which again is a great place to be. Uh, we definitely encourage you to get involved with SFN if you're interested in neuroscience and the intersection of neuroscience and policy. Um, it's a great, great department there and uh, there's a great fellowship. So um, moving on to current, um, or not current, late, uh, latest uh, position after SFN. Um, so I guess I went back to my roots in some ways to the university. And this is another thing um, that was really exciting um, to be on the government relations staff for University of California. Again, I, I had some um, connections with some of the uh, campuses when I was there. Obviously, UC is a large recipient of federal funding. Um, they do a lot of different types of research. You know, this would take a long time to explain all the different things we did here. But um, in general, I would say um, I was on the research staff, again, advocating for um, uh, research in the UC system. And again, because it's a national leader, um, advocating for research with Congress, working with the administration, and again, connecting with federal agencies. How do we position the university and researchers um, for being successful for grants and also continuing to support uh, research with Congress? Uh, again, involved a lot of um, analyzing legislation related to policy that impacted university research in particular. We did a lot of different types of Capitol Hill visits and briefings, which are uh, panels with researchers inviting um, Hill staffers. We invited agency staff um, to hear about the great work that's going on at the UC. Um, one example here is one, uh, we did a number of these events, but one was about the research, sort of state of the research at the UCs and during COVID. Um, several of these are um, should be on online. Um, because it's a large system and working with a number of campuses too, um, there are questions about how they could apply for different grants and so on. And sometimes there are specific questions from campuses that we answered um, in terms of funding or when they had um, researchers or some of their leadership um, or their deans of research or, or engineering come to DC and we would take them up to the Hill and all of that. So um, one example I wanted to show here my first um, project at UC was related to AI research, which I was not trained in. So that's a tip uh, to think about this because I have a PhD in biochemistry. So, you know, I had to learn this um, quickly to um, sell the importance of AI research on the Hill and showcase again, researchers in the, AI, uh, in the UC system who are doing research on this topic. Um, we also participated in the Rally for Medical Research, which you probably know about. Uh, there's a lot that goes into a position like this. I'm happy to talk more about this if you're interested uh, here or, or afterwards. Um, but it was really a great role to have um, and to immerse really in advocacy for research and what that means with Congress and a lot of Hill meetings and um, really enjoy the role. Um, and wanted to mention here again, Phil Harmon, who's in the picture. So he was my direct supervisor, uh, again, ex he's extremely knowledgeable about research issues and uh, took me on and taught me a lot about the role. Um, he is probably a, a large reason why I ended up uh, applying to this fellowship in Congress because uh, they really um, do a lot to showcase the importance of UC research in Congress and want to um, transition to that side to, to be able to support research hopefully from, from Congress. So um, they're really tied into the uh, uh, congressional offices and from the California delegation. And that was really interesting. Um, I wanted to showcase just a couple of examples of impact um, from the UC and um, just because I think they're really good ways to engage. So one is um, 
organizing this briefing on the impact of COVID on early career researchers, the UC system. I think this is the first or among the first they've done that um, included grad students and postdocs from across the UCs. Um, this is also online if you want to watch. But again, we invited Hill staff and agency staff to hear about the impacts um, of the pandemic on UC researchers and um, their um, careers and what this is going to mean if uh, they were able to go back to lab and all of that it was really well attended. Um, the other thing we did is we responded to this request for information. So again, this came up again. I, we did this um, SFN, and again, this is something you can you can look at doing. Um, NSF was looking for input on their strategic plan, I believe, 2020 to 2026. Um, and so we wrote this language about how we should support um, the STEM workforce. And, you know, it's pretty generic, but it was part of a larger um a document that went to NSF through AAU and also a bunch of universities and other organizations participated. And it was a really nice sort of collective effort um, to, to encourage NSF to invest more in, in diversifying the STEM workforce and supporting the people who are doing research. Um, the other thing which I'm really proud of, and uh, probably this remains my greatest accomplishment to date that I consider anyway, um, is to include language on postdocs uh, in the CHIPS Act, which you probably heard about. We can talk more about that, but um, it's a large piece of legislation supporting um, science and uh, competitiveness. Um, we worked with Lofgren, Representative Lofgren's office. This is a press release um, that came out in 2021. Um, where essentially we worked with the House Science Committee and through her office um, to include postdocs in the bill. So you can see this is what an amendment looks like to a bill, uh, which essentially includes postdocs in these lines and then also in, um, created um, supplementary funds awarded to professional development, which isn't very common uh, because a lot of the uh, bills focus on sort of research money and um, funding for the research itself. Um, this was sort of unique in the sense that we wanted to make sure that training and professional development um, also got funding in the bill. So again, this goes back to my roots sort of many years ago when I started with the training um, and talking about um, why we need to support both research and training for for scientists, but uh, evidently it was important to convey to the House Science Committee that postdocs were a big part of the pipeline. And um, this was really exciting to see that the it was included in the bill and the bill became a law and all of that. So this is a, a win uh, legislatively, I would say, and a big, big reason why I'm interested now in working more on legislation because um, I think it's very impactful. Um, and on to the Congressional Fellowship. Um, so again, this is um, somewhat new. So the AAAS program uh, um, obviously is well, well known. Uh, everyone, so it's been around for about 50 years. Um, ASGCT is a new partner. I believe it's a new partner this year, American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. And so I'm the first fellow sponsored by them. Uh, which is really exciting. Um, part of the uh, what the role will entail is essentially working with members of Congress um, to talk to them about scientific topics, um, staffing them, potentially in hearings, drafting legislative text, um, sort of supporting their mission as as a as a scientist and making sure that they can um, work on evidence based policy. Um, if you work in a personal office, um, you meet with constituents from that state uh, or that district. Um, and then again, sort of helping staff the member and, and um, provide information to make their job easier um, and, and bring your expertise um, to the field. But again, I'm really looking forward to um, learning about what it's like to be in Congress uh, because I have a little bits and pieces of that from the outside and from uh, the advocacy side of things, but it could be really exciting um, to be there. So more to come on that. Um, so that's sort of the uh, career 
portion up to now. Um, and now I wanted to spend just the last few minutes um, talking about um, how you can get involved, right? So my career, I think, provides a good um, framework for some of the things I've done, right? I've been involved with a lot of different sort of stakeholders, universities, think tanks, societies, nonprofits, so on. Uh, these are all options. And so policy isn't, um, you know, there isn't one size fits all. You can uh, enter one way, uh, move around, you know, do all kinds of things. People have all kinds of careers and different roles. So I think that's one thing that's exciting about the field. Um, you can kind of follow your interests. Uh, but so these are some set settings you might think about. Think tanks, universities, professional societies. Um, a lot of them are sort of on the research side. Again, some do advocacy. Um, nonprofits and funding agencies, of course, if you're interested in governments, um, federal state governments and Capitol Hill, of course, uh, are sort of unique. Uh, biotech companies, also there's policies related to um, research and science issues and companies also do lobby, I believe. Um, but again, you can also be sort of on the, you can be on the kind of research side of things, or you can advocate or kind of in between. I think a lot of jobs are in between, but some people don't want to be to advocacy. So you can be sort of the uh, researcher who provides the background for people who go to the Hill and advocate. Um, job titles, I think this is always useful to see, but um um, some examples include um, folks who do research and reporting, right, usually analysts. Um, if you want to communicate and promote science, you're getting a little bit into advocacy, advocacy manager, lobbyist. These are kinds of titles you might see. Um, organizing and facilitating programs. This is often in the government, NIH, for example, program specialists. Um, or you can do uh, public service that's relevant to policies. The policy advisor, this can be in the White House. It can be also be in Congress. Uh, and then you can be uh, on either congressional committees or Senate or the House, again, personal office or committee, um, which is, again, you'd really in the thick of everything uh, when it comes to what's going on in Congress. And um, these are all different types of roles. Some of the things are common. Um, other things you do, do specifically in those positions. Um, I would also encourage you, especially if there are trainees in the audience, that you already have a lot of skills that you can bring um, to this field, but also give you some ideas of things you can develop. So um, skills that you have, uh, you know your subject matter, you understand how the scientific process works, you can analyze data and think critically about that, and that's something that... Um, Policymakers appreciate someone who come, comes with an analytical mind and can sort of sort through issues and quickly figure out what needs to be done and let them know, um, again, to make their life easier. And you can sort of throw, sort through a lot of data to, to get to the bottom line of what they need. Uh, project management is um, something that's common. Obviously, you've done that if you're in the lab, and um, that's something that you definitely do in policy. Um, things I would encourage you to develop, uh, coming back to, to when we're talking about the web and how things work, um, you often communicate with non-scientists, uh, so that's a skill to, you know, be able to learn how to, um, to tell your message, who you're talking to, and analyzing your audience. Again, this can be, uh, you know, it could be a university, it could be a member of Congress, it could be a federal agency, all of that and who you're talking to pl plays into account into um, how you talk about an issue. Um, consensus building, I mentioned this in the beginning, um, is really important because a lot of decisions are made collectively and consensus can be achieved at different levels. Uh, different things are possible depending on where you are and influence also by the political environment, who's in power, who's on your side and um, a lot of that. Um, and then the last two, of course, networking and professional relationships. I definitely wouldn't be here uh, and heading to where I am right now without all the people that I know and uh, all the network that I've built in DC. Um, these are people that, um, a lot of them I would say are peer mentors that I was able to call on uh, when I had questions or issues or didn't know what I wanted to do and they helped guide me but also mentors, as I showed you all the pictures along the way, all those people have been really helpful and are still 
um, available if I if I have questions. So do do think about building a good network as that can get you can get you far. And it's a it's a big way to move ahead in DC, especially. Um, and then also wanted to talk about how to develop policy knowledge. Um, this this can be a longer discussion, but uh, some of the things you can sort of gather from what I've done, but would encourage you to join or start your own policy discussion group. Uh, writing op-eds and blog posts is useful. So I would say trying to work on writing things that are not academic papers that are sort of get your ideas out there. Um, Performing informational interviews uh, is really helpful too with people who are in different positions. And then you can sort of learn about what they do and think about maybe, do I want to go this route? Is this something that I might be interested in? Uh, people like to talk about themselves and it's a good way to um, get to know people and grow your network. If you're going to uh, work with The Hill, we definitely encourage you to research your representatives and um, do your background background research on whoever you're meeting with, really uh, understanding where they're coming from and what their interests are and how they can engage with you or why they would be interested and what you can provide them. Um, utilizing social media, this has been helpful for me, I think, to promote um, some of the things I've been doing along the way. People kind of got to know me, uh, somebody who's interested in research and science and higher ed, and you kind of build a brand. Um, and you can promote the things you write or, or podcasts or presentations you're on. I would encourage you to do that, um, even if you're in research, um, just to um, kind of start to build some of that momentum on, on social media. Um, and then fellowships, again, are a great way to, to get into the field, as you've seen. I, and I've done a, I've been a fellow with other groups, too, um, that I didn't talk about here. But um, those are really a great way to get in get your foot in the door and I'm happy to talk more about that here or, or, or offline. Um, there are a number of different ways to engage. Again, SFN was a great way to do that. And um, there are many other options too. Um, and then finally, how to stand out. Um, this is something that in some ways I think is important to consider because um, policy is really becoming a popular career path, I think for a lot of scientists and trainees um, what's really worked well for me, I would say, is having something that I'm really passionate about. So I've always advocated for uh, improving research, supporting young scientists um, from the university side and from the uh, policy side at the federal level. And I'm hoping to continue with this trend. And so I think people know me. Uh, I was able to you know, speak and write about things that I care about um, and then was able to engage with a few groups and organizations that provided experience, right? So make your voice heard, find ways to gain experience, you know, writing, speaking, uh, volunteer, do a research project, you know, raise your hand and volunteer for things um, uh, as you're building your portfolio. And then show that you're excited and committed about policy and your topic. Um, this is something also goes a long way because uh, I think policy is a, it's a very involved field, you know, you're work long hours sometimes, and um, you really have to have a passion for what you're doing, I think. Um, and people that will hire you want to see that from you and that um, you're really committed to what you're doing. That goes a long way. So um, lastly, just a few resources. Um, there's, there's probably more, but just a few organizations here um, and a couple of articles um, about skills you can develop. This is from uh, Chris Pickett from ASBNB Today. Uh, we've had Seeger, who actually uh, showed her, we invited her to our um, UofL session, but uh, she's at FASAB. And she wrote this really interesting article about from pipettes to science policy, it's a hard transition into the field. Uh, would encourage you to get involved with AAAS. Uh, I'm also on the Section X steering committee, so the, the science, uh, societal impacts of science and engineering. Um, there's a lot of people in policy who are involved in the society, great network. JSPG, uh, again, can be a great way to engage um, as an early career person, just start to get um, some experience with writing and editing and, and speaking on policy. And then... Um, um, finally, AIP, this is one of the resources um, that I recommend. They have a great um, federal policy newsletter that um, I think it's monthly, but um, it's FYI. 
um, AIP, and they have a lot of good uh, summaries of what's going on federally on with agencies and Congress and a lot of different topics. So we definitely subscribe to that. It's free and really helpful. So these are just a few. There's more. I'm happy to chat more about other things you're interested in. And then I um, just wanted to share my contacts. I'm happy to um, talk more about any of the things I discussed today. I'm on LinkedIn, on Twitter. Um, my email is on my website. I didn't put that here, jnabankston.com. You're welcome to email me also if you want to chat more about policy. And i um, happy to uh, have more conversations. And thanks again for the invite. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wealth of knowledge and, and experiences to, to really build out um, this amazing presentation. Um, so yes, I did drop um, her website in the chat, so feel free to reach out there as well. But we have a couple of questions we'd like to dive in. Um, okay, so this is submitted anonymously. Hello, I wanted to know if there's any way to volunteer at any of the mentioned organizations as a graduate student or undergrad. Yeah, so um, I would um, encourage you to get engaged with the Journal of Science Policy and Governance. So they have, um, actually, I think right now the the application is open for the editorial board. So because it's an early career journal, we encourage you to um, submit there if you have ideas for papers, but also the board itself is um, early career. And again, that's a great way to learn about um um, policy writing and editing. It's a good sort of CV boost. Um, other things I mentioned in relation to scientific societies. Um, so if you're a member of a society, I would encourage you to look at their resources. There's, a lot of them now have policy committees and groups and subcommittees you can engage with and um, try to get some of that experience. Those are, those are two good ways to get started. Perfect. Next question, um, coming from Ayomid Kazim. As a graduate student, how can you also be on the forefront in bridging the gap between science and policy? Yeah, I think one of the things um, when I started, you know, I did a lot of writing about um, issues that were important to me for either blogs that were sort of early career. You know, I worked, worked for Women in Science magazine, right? So trying to find somewhere where um, these issues will be received and pitch your ideas to them. Um, that's probably the easiest until you start to build a little momentum. And, um, you know, you could you could sort of look for internships and fellowships. Those are great ways to get in. But uh, I think building some of this portfolio beforehand um, can help you get into that. Wonderful. Next question from Nasir Udin. Applying for fellowship uh, needs a recommendation letter. Who can be the best uh, recommender to get a good fellowship? Uh, what were your strategies to prepare? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think, so letters, uh, definitely from your advisor, I would encourage you to have somebody who is also not academic, who can speak to your other sorts of skills, right? So working in teams, project management, uh, community building, if you're volunteering somewhere, like those kinds of things that are not academic, but what is this person like? What are the things they do outside of the lab? And they do ask you those questions in interviews too, because they want to see that you'd have a life outside of the fellowship. So <laughs> um, for strategy, so I think I was in very different positions in the first fellowship and this one. So when I was at, uh, applied to SFN, um, that was interesting. That's an interesting story, actually, because um, I don't have a background in neuroscience, but uh, and they actually a lot of societies want people in those with those disciplinary backgrounds. And so I really had to sell myself and, you know, all the work we had done with future of research and other things and say, you know, I'm an advocate for science. Here's all the things I've done. I think I can help you advance the mission of SFN and so on. And so they let me do that. Um, uh, I think that at that point, I, I showed that I was really passionate about advocacy and science and all the things I had done, which I mentioned sort of writing and, you know, working with future research on those projects um, had showcased that I was an advocate and I, I showed that. Um, I think now with the Congressional Fellowship, I mean, I will say it's very competitive. Um, but I think, and in this case, I think it's, people that apply to this are really unique and have different backgrounds. I think for my my strength was that I had worked with Capitol Hill in two different roles. 
Um, I had a good case of saying I'm really interested in Congress and, you know, I kind of understand how it works from these different roles, but I want to be in Congress, right? And so I think selling your background and what you've done to that point, um, that's really case by case and how you think that's going to help you go forward. Absolutely. Um, okay, so next question was anonymously anonymously submitted. Um, so what do you think the best way is to get your foot in the door uh, with science policy as a graduate student? No experience. Uh, many training opportunities and fellowships seem to want that experience, and other resources online, like webinars, books, etc., may not provide guidance or that specific mentorship. Yeah, I think some of the things I already mentioned. So, um, so again, JSPG is a good way to get involved in your society or a nonprofit. Um, I think my experience with future research actually, I think, um, brings up a good point that um, if you have a specific interest in policy, you can sort of see who is working on those issues, right? So this sort of happened to work out that you know this nonprofit was working on research issues. Um, I volunteered with them, you know, I wasn't getting paid initially, and then I worked for them. So I think kind of raising your hand and saying, okay, I want to volunteer on this project, you know, even if it's a couple hours a week, and you kind of start to build some of those things, right? So that would be my advice is look at who's working on issues you're interested in. Um, if there's a university group you can get involved in, I mean, those things are useful too. kind of local engagement and things you can do there. Um, look at who's nationally working on those things. I mean, every almost every issue, there's probably some non a nonprofit or, you know, again, your society can be a good resource for getting engaged with some of their programs, you know, we're organize a policy panel and things like that. Um, I think during COVID also, um, a lot of virtual opportunities have popped up, which I think still exists. So we actually run this uh, certificate program through UC Irvine. We did another program with the University's Research Association. Um, anyway, those are just a couple of things I've, I've done myself. But there's things that are online that you can learn um, as you are um, trying to learn some of the content. I think virtual opportunities are there, too. And just to emphasize the virtual option, um, and we are completely free to use. So the National Research Mentoring Network, if you do sign up and create your profile, you do gain access to all of our resources in addition to a one-on-one -on -one guided virtual mentorship. Um, so I cannot stress that enough. I did drop the link in the chat. Please feel free to create your profile. Also, we have one more question and I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, uh, this is coming from Ms. Grace Stewart. And so did you, um, did you do the research looking at the impacts of COVID on the UC system yourself or did you mainly act as a communicator uh, slash advocate or did you do both? <laughs> Yeah, more the latter. Um, so the idea was uh, actually, we actually, we did research on um, sort of how much money was going to cost the university or how much they would lose actually because of COVID and all the research that wasn't getting done. Um, that's not really public information, but um with a panel, so the idea was to really showcase the stories of young people in research and, um, you know, how the pandemic impacted them. And it was, like I said, it was really well attended. We prepare them. And that's something I should have mentioned to that. Um, you know, when you organize these events, there's a lot of training involved and uh, the scientists who are on the panels and the kinds of things they want to emphasize to make sure that it's their story, but also we want to sort of tell the story of research and research impacts, right? So there's a bit of coaching there to how how they can speak to um, staff from Congress, right? Um, but yeah, the, that was a that was a good event, and it's something that's encouraged to do. I think if you want to emphasize some of these issues, is to get the people who are working on these things are impacted by the policy. Um, to really speak to it on a panel like this. Absolutely. Um, such wonderful advice and, and such um, enriched conversation. And then I see some more questions coming in, but I highly um, urge you to uh, connect with um, Dr. Bankston via LinkedIn or her website. Um, and we were thrilled to be able to have this open discussion. 
And also, friendly reminder, we will be placing this recording on the NRMN YouTube channel. Um, so please feel free to reference this and utilize this as a resource. And we really hope that we um, brought in some perspectives and some opportunities for you guys today. Um, again, I want to express extreme gratitude to Dr. Bankston for taking her time today. And thank you, everybody, for, for staying on to the webinar and, and even as we run over um, five minutes. But <laughs> thank you again. And I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. Take care and tune in for more. Thank you.